Good morning, LBC Radio. My name is Koi Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome guest, but before we get into that, just want to shout out that we have a new website up and running. It is CoryRosenProductions.com. That's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N Productions.com, and you can go there and check out more about me, more about the podcast, and all the guests that I've had on before, and just a quick shout out, the Central Pennsylvania Music Hall of Fame Awards are coming up, so make sure you nominate those artists get those favorite people on and if you would like please nominate me the story podcast as one of the best local music podcasts are you on there as well uh not as a nomination this year no okay you have been on in the past though uh no 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 nope i'm in the shadows well hopefully this brings you in the light this is (laughs) tommy b tommy b is a lifelong multi-instrumentalist currently performing 100 plus shows a year across pennsylvania and the surrounding states Providing professional, quality entertainment for over a decade, Tommy B. was born and raised in Massachusetts and is on track to release three albums in 2023. Typically, Tommy performs as a solo act that sounds like a trio, arranging 50s to present classic rock hits with a splash of country, pop, and originals on a looping 12-string guitar, harmonizing vocals, cajon and percussion, through the top of the line Bose L1 Pro 32 Sub 1 line array system. Tommy can also play straight acoustic sets as well as full band sets if desired. Tommy, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. A little early, but uh, I'm loving it. Loving it. How are you little, doing? I'm doing great, man. And check out your suit. I got to talk about this for a few seconds. <laughs> you have some of the craziest suits. Why? Someone's got to do it. So, <laughs> Someone's got to do it, and then I don't see anyone else doing it. And is there is that like a... Well, how did you fall in love with the suits? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, that's actually a funny question. So when I started going solo in January of 2021, I was not confident in my musical abilities, my act. I just, you know, I was new. I didn't really try promoting or booking myself. And then, so when I did, I was like, well, I got to do something that's eye-catching. Like, we're all wearing T-shirts and jeans. Right. And so what makes me different than the next guy who's way better, who's wearing T-shirt and jeans? So I came up with uh, two things simultaneously. It was professional quality entertainment. It's like, okay, if I can not over drink at shows and if I can be professional. Step one. Uh, step one. Right. If I can provide a quality act you know, that's entertaining and engaging every single show. And then with the suits, I coupled that with what I call the peacock method, which is like, a, hey, look at me, and you're going to remember this. You know what I mean? Just by right. visuals. And so often I'll walk in a room wearing something like this and it's, Oh my man, that guy right there. Like, you know, so it's this eye catching pop that stops people in their tracks. And so I kind of used that as a crutch when I first started, so much so that now, though I feel confident in my act, you know, I provide pre- professional quality entertainment every show. I still wear the suits. I still wear ridiculous, like flamboyant, loud shirts. I'll dress up as Wonder Woman every now and again. I mean, <laughs> I've done some wild stuff. I'll show you pictures. But now it's at this point, it's just a part of what Tommy B is. And it's like, well, to go back to a t-shirt and jeans would kind of be silly at this point. It feels wrong. Yeah, so it, wrong. it was kind of like a fake it till you make it, and now it's stuck. <laughs> so uh, going back to the beginning of your story then, what was it that really got you invested into music and into this whole idea of performing in general? Probably probably my dad, because he's, he's been playing his whole life, and he plays drums guitar and he's one of the best singers i've ever heard and you know shout out to old rattlebones is a, a solo well an original band that he's in they do hard blues and they're great but uh probably him i mean and not directly because it's not like he sat me down and said son we're going to teach you how to play music you know he just did it and i think just growing up in a household where someone just did it i just also did it just and, rubs off a little bit yeah so i've been playing the same instruments and and more since as long as I can remember. And I just, I've been playing out every now and again, different band variations and open mics, but uh, in 2021, I happened to go solo and I never stopped. So at what point did you start making, I mean, your style is 50s to present classic rock hits with a, with a twist. Mm -hmm. So when did you start working and building that? Oh, probably at the end of 2021, I started to get it because when I first started, I was just really a, a solo cover act. But there was always something else I needed, and I didn't know what it was. So Mm -hmm. some of my early shows, I also had a keyboard. So I would loop the guitar and then play solos on the keyboard to fill the, 
you know, where a guitar solo would be. Cause in classic rock, there's, there's guitar solos, you know what I mean? And so how do I fill that space? So it was a keyboard for a while. Then I moved to an Omnichord for a while, which is a super cool instrument. I call it the cheater's keyboard. I'll have to show you some pictures. I was say, yeah, I'm not sure about that it's one. It's this weird, like, quasi-accordion keyboard, you know, where your left hand can do chords. Like, one button is a full chord. And then yeah. there's, like, a swipe strip that is all the notes of a oh, keyboard. Wow. So if you hit a chord with your left, you can't hit a wrong note with your right. That's a, so it's almost like an auto harp. Of, yeah, keyboard fashion. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and so I was doing that, and that was close, but it wasn't quite right. And then uh, I saw these two girls up in England, uh, Lori and uh, Maria McCavity, music up there, and they're these very talented women who uh, are like I think between seventeen and twenty-two. I think Maria is, and their voices are incredible. Sure, but they sit on a cajon and they play a six-string guitar and they have a tambourine with their other foot, and I was like, oh man, I could like be a drummer. And get away with, you know, singing like Wagon Wheel and stuff. Because I'm actually a drummer above all other things. Oh, wow. But, you know, no one's paying me, you know, for a three-hour solo drumming act yet. You know, one one of these days. But so I was like, oh, I'm going to try that. So I got the cajon and a tambourine. And, and that really felt right, having all that percussion. And then, so what I did to fill the gaps with the solos is the cajon added this bass layer of percussion. And then I could just finger pick shred through a what would be a solo that mm-hmm. I'm not really a, a flat picker. So it, I was able to kind of mesh the, those whole worlds. So it, it's a twist in that I don't do straight, you know, gnarly solos instead of finger pick it. And there's a bass set of percussion underneath. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, thank God you're a percussionist because doing guitar, <laughs> cajon, tambourine all at the same time mm-hmm. must be wild. Yeah, and to your point exactly, thank God I'm a percussionist first because... You know, a lot of people look at that and they go, how do you how do you do that? And it's like, because I'm secretly a drummer. <laughs> so for me, it's just like second nature. <laughs> I have a superpower. It's called I am a drummer. And limb independence is so important. Yes. I'd argue for any musician, really. Oh, absolutely. You, you kind of need it for all instruments, but uh, um, not to the extent that a drummer or, or an organist, really. Uh, <laughs> with using your feet, your hands, your mind, your voice all at the same time. Yep. One of the, one of the best skills you could do as a musician is learn limb independence, and I'd argue, learn how to play drums because you're gonna have that internal rhythm. Yeah, it definitely helps, and uh, you know what you call uh, limb independence, absolutely. And as as a drummer, I would call that uh, four way coordination. Mm. And so you know, I used to start singing behind the drum kit, and so it was like, okay, well, how do I add vocals? Well, that's just five way coordination. And then when I started playing guitar, it was like. Oh wow! If I got really good at guitar, I would need all ten of my fingers, and that's just ten-way coordination. And so, what's the difference? You know, once you learn one, it's like if I can get all these independent. Oh, I could also sing, and add my feet. So you know, now we're at thirteen, and it's like, well, if I had any more limbs, it would it would just continue building crazy, on dude. that. That's crazy, man. So, you started writing originals as well. When did that start happening? Oh, with my friend Jake in high school, probably 2010, I started writing originals. Maybe a couple of years before that. Pretty much as soon as I started playing guitar, which was September 2nd of 2009, uh, I started writing originals. And what were the what was the content? What was the thought process? How was the songwriting? Uh, it was point? pretty much. I'm one of the biggest uh, Simon and Garfunkel fans, and so my guitar playing really is Paul Simon. Uh, it's, you could hear so much Paul Simon and everything that I do. Plus I'm a huge progressive rock fan as a drummer. So I try to do like progressive folk pretty much. And so I was writing in that style with way less, um, delicate lyrics. You know, it it was very just direct, uh, lyrics. So I kind of made up for the the lack of lyrical prowess (laughs) with progressive folk guitar. And so here's a question. I don't know if, if you're, uh, able to answer this or not but what is progressive music what is what does that mean to be progressive folk or progressive rock for those oh, who might not know yeah not a problem i the layman's terms i would say is just like very complicated you know like progressive if you put very complicated in front of any word so like progressive rock it can just be very complicated rock um but also the the joke is you know progressive musicians are just uh failed jazz musicians say, yeah, just jazz. you know what i mean like we're, we're so good but we're not good enough 
you know, to be to be jazz or to throw a, you know, hold a candle to any actual jazz musician. So it's kind of gives you this freedom of being like, okay, well, I could not know the rules or I could know them and break them or just disregard them and call it progressive. You know, it, it just gives you this unleashed world of freedom um, into whatever genre you're doing. So when I'm doing progressive folk, oftentimes I'll throw in mixed time signatures or I'll, I'll do like, you know, key changes and stuff. Uh, but it's still folky, you That's know? That's really cool. I'm always a, always a fan of uh, mixed time signatures or throwing wild things at people. Oh, I, I love it. And it's kind of a curse too because now I've been in the studio and I'm, I finished the one album and I'm still recording the other two for this year. But, you know, I'll, I'll write a melody first and then I'll write the music around that. And mm -hmm. so when I write a melody in sometimes 5, 4, 7, 8, you know, 15, 4, you know, it makes then creating the rest kind of a challenge. But even harder than that is going into the studio and then learning actually what I wrote and go, oh, my God, how do I record that? That's just a pain. <laughs> so as fun as it is to throw at other people, it's a, it's a challenge. So I'm telling your studio engineer, hey, listen, this is a time of signature, which you probably have never recorded in your entire life. <laughs> Here, go for it. Yeah, my my, uh, my man Steve at uh, Shaw Ranch Studio, luckily he's also a drummer. Mm. So w when I have these, like, hey, man, only once in this song, we're going to do a random 5-4. I mean, he's he's on it. He's on it. That's great. That's that's good. I'd argue that we need more mixed meters in uh, music in general, honestly. Uh, I'm with you there. I'll agree. Uh, do you know of any artists that already do that, or? Oh, plenty. Um, I don't know of any recent, but uh, you know, I'm one of the world's biggest Rush and Genesis fans. Mm. You know, I, I think uh, out of the nine tattoos I have uh, hidden under the suit, I think seven are Rush tattoos, and I have some Genesis ones coming because they're all over the place with time signatures. And then, like, even Yes, um, they're huge for that. They're even more complicated than than Rush and Genesis, or even really? Frank Zappa. So, you know, I'm kind of like a 70s, 80s prog fan, but if if I can find any progressive folk musicians now, oh, I'd be about it. Speaking of uh, Rush, uh, you must be a fan of Solar Federation. The oh, Rush yeah, the, Federation. Yeah, yeah, the tribute band, of course. Yeah. I haven't seen them, but every time they they come through town, I get like 10 messages and phone calls being like, Solar Federation's coming to town. You should check them out. Yeah, definitely. You should definitely check them out. They're an awesome uh, band from around here. Uh, that They are a Rush tribute band. Um Another thing I would like to bring light to is that uh, there is a uh, a music collective program. It's called Tuplets for Toddlers. Okay. And uh, what they did is a bunch of YouTube music personalities like 12 Tome, Adam Neely, 8-Bit uh, Musician, really really great musicians on their own, and they, they were uh, given the task of creating children's music, hmm. but mixing up, like uh, uh, introducing an advanced music theory thing, right? So... Frere Jaco is transformed into a 7-8 piece. Or the ants go marching in has tempo modulations. Okay. Or uh, Bingo, one of my favorite ones, they, they you know, it's B-I-N-G-O, mm -hmm. but they did it in 5-4. So it's B-I-N-G-O, B-I-N-G-O, so B-I-N-G-O, B-I-N-G-O. Oh, that's of, awesome. Yeah, so it's introducing tuplets for, uh, to toddlers, essentially. Okay. And uh, that's just another music program that I really wanted to shout out because I think that's really cool. And we should be pushing music past the standard 4-4 four, four, and 3-4 four that we all know and love. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I'm going to have to check that out because that sounds awesome. It's really cool. I definitely highly recommend that. And it's and it's really cool, too, because they're all instrumental. So, so you'd kind of have to guess which okay. one it is, too. Uh, well, obviously, it's named on Spotify. But, right, but you'll have to try to catch the melody for yourself. And they have a whole YouTube video explaining how they did it and, uh, and like going into the you know, deep, nerdy stuff of what mm -hmm. they were doing. So de definitely highly recommend Tablet for Toddlers. Back to you, though. You are creating three albums. Why, how, and when? Cool. So the first one, I just got the uh, last set of masters. So you have uh, three recordings straight off you know, the press. So I just got those back like last week. Uh, and so the release date, that's going into uh, DistroKid today. Mm. You know, So I just got all the album artwork back, too. And so that's... You can upload it today, and with them, it's like a four-week turnaround time to get on all platforms. And, of course, all platforms, I'm at Tommy B Entertainment on everything when it, when I do have a release date and they do show up. that That's the first one. The first album is all the songs that I wrote within the first decade and a half of me playing guitar. Mm. And it was like, well, 
yeah, I started this music thing in 2021. It's like, well, oh my God, I don't have any, I don't have a product. I don't have content. I'm just a disposable act that when I'm gone off stage, like, Hey, it's over. You know, it's like, oh man, well, what are all these other musicians doing? Oh, they're writing songs and releasing them. I should probably get into that direction. And I have all these songs. So it's like, well, let's get into the studio. So the first album's that. So it's very like trebly guitar and like fast paced, like moving, very direct lyrics. And then the and that's a, a six song EP and that's just going to be called Tommy B B one, and then the second one is uh, going to be called Tommy B B two and that's mostly done recording but that's a ten song one, and that's got some awesome collaborations on it and I, I'm so excited about that. Um, Can you announce any of those or? You sure. No, I'd love to. Yeah, because I got to brag about the people that are on there. So uh, I have this uh, one friend, Megan Paulette, otherwise known as the Queen of Hugs. She was nominated. Uh, for a, uh, a couple of awards there at the Josie Music Awards up in uh, oh, the Grand Ole Opry yeah. a few months ago. You know, I see this, and I'm like, oh, my God, what was she doing on my album? Like, she's this good. And it was so funny. We're in the studio recording. Uh, she was on two songs. And, you know, the guys heard me sing, you know, until I'm blue in the face. But then Megan gets up there and just in one take just belts out the most incredible, just breathtaking stuff. And it's like, Wow. You know, so she was her whole stuff was done in like ten minutes. Uh, but I have other collaborations, uh, like my friend Jacob Hebert. He's a, a former Nashville recording artist. Him and I had a, a co-write on this second album. I've uh, Eric Ryder and Nate Deitch playing guitar. Um, Alexia Christian singing on it. And oh yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. She was actually on the story yeah. a while ago. Yeah, she's she's on a couple of songs dream which is a co-write with jake hebert and megan paulette's on that and eric Ryder plays a guitar and then she also is on the song dight in summer uh so yeah she's she's got some awesome parts in there that's awesome and then the third album's a concept album it's, it's a five song ep it ends with wicked game by chris isaac uh because the whole album is like a kind of a, a story it's a, a love story you know that you know, i felt personally when i was writing it and it kind of starts with you know, uh, me and this partner, you know, are in love, having a great time. And then it's like, well, maybe we'll replicate that into the second song. And then it goes, mm -hmm. are you ever going to come home in the next song? And then the fourth song ends with, you're going to stay in your familiar hell instead of taking my hand into your unfamiliar heaven. Mm -hmm. And it just this bombastic, you know, cannons going off, fireworks in the end, just really sealing the deal on this four song concept and then opening it up to my first cover, which is chris isaac's wicked game which i think was kind of relevant to the thing and so it's there's so many exciting things coming down the pipe and working with so many cool people now uh i just i can't wait it's like i'm all, I antsy to have all three of these in my hand just so i can start handing them out to people so what was it like planning this surely you just didn't decide one day i'm gonna do all this what was it like to plan that all out uh well i'm good at excel spreadsheets and I can only kind of look and plan and think in terms of Excel. And so I just wrote out every part. Uh, well, after learning the recording process of the first album, I, I then went, well, I'm disorganized. I got to get that better. <laughs> and of course, I was still writing music at the same time. And so I put it all on an Excel, like by date with studio dates and who's going to come in when and do what, you know, who's playing bass. Oh, that's another big one. I can't forget the 12 string one of the world, Colby Dove is playing bass on like all three of them and that guy man without him it wouldn't even be an album well wow. like he's because i'm not a bassist but i can play bass so when i play bass it's okay but when he plays bass it's like oh my god you're writing bass parts yeah always get a good bass player that knows what they're doing he's fantastic there's a couple songs where he's playing a 12 string bass, 12 string bass. yeah and so it's a four string but tripled up and so every oh, wow. note's a power chord essentially well you know it's a bar chord, I guess. And yeah, he just plays it like it's butter. Dude, he's incredible on that thing. That's so cool. And so, yeah, so with that, it was all get it on a, a spreadsheet, take it to my very patient, wonderful guy at the studio, Steve Shaw of uh, Shaw Ranch Studio. And yeah, he's helped me tremendously keep organized and, and we're going through it. So we've, we've bookended it with the three albums and said, you know, let's stop writing, Tom, for the love of all that is good. Stop writing and getting crazy and let's just finish these three and so we're on track to do that that's awesome so your first album is kind of like okay this is this is me this is who i've been over the past 10 or so years yeah and then your second album is more of a okay this is what i can do this is who i have in my network mm -hmm. and this is what we can all put together yeah 
And then the third one is, this is what goes on in my mind, per se. Yeah, I mean, that's not a bad one. You know, it was kind of a love story that I, I lived and am kind of finishing up now, taking my own advice, listening to my own lyrics, you know, and just calling it over. Uh, and it's it's wild. So, yeah, the, the third one's like a deeply personal, massive look, insight into the saga that's actually been going on in my life for like over a decade. But I would never written about it until you know, last January I started that. That's awesome. So before you did music, I know you had a, a career in real estate. <laughs> yeah, actually. So that's going on simultaneously. So I, I don't sell houses as a real estate agent. I'm, I'm not licensed, though I took all the classes. Uh, I don't have as much interest in selling houses. So what I'm about is uh, buying, flipping, renting. Mm. And it used to be selling, but now it's pretty much buying, flipping, and, and, and renting them out. And so, yeah, I, I'm also a property manager of my own properties at this point. So that's really cool. That, I'm sure that's helped you massively with your uh, musical organization. Actually, no. No? Yeah, so and they're oddly two separate animals. The only thing that's really crossed over is uh, organization on Excel spreadsheets. Because mm -hmm. what, what I do for my rental properties is, like, massive Excel spreadsheets. Because every, you know... You have a two dollar light bulb has to go into the spreadsheet for tax purposes, and you know by date and by house. And so when I have like six houses on the spreadsheet, and I have a bajillion purchases up and down, and contractors, and and why, and you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. It, so I kind of took that and went, oh, I should do that for all of my music expenses. You know what I mean? So shout out to Woodshed uh, Guitar Works up in Carlisle, who it's like I I probably that's probably my biggest expense every year. It's just being like, can you please fix my guitar? Right. And uh, so that's really the only crossover. Other than that, I mean, you know, I have a, a bachelor's in business management. I'm kind of entrepreneurial in nature and innovative. So it's it, they're separate, but there's a core of who I am as a person that helps me kind of run both of them as two separate entities. And like the money from either, they don't cross. Like all the finances are totally separate. So it's not like if my music's dying, I can pull money from my real estate or vice versa at all. That's kind of how it should be. Uh, keep it, keep that in mind, musicians. What separate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's like I'm not letting one sinking ship sink the other. Right. And I don't, you know, want one that's you know on a rising tide to pull the other one up. It's like, well, let's just have, let's just send both of these airplanes out and see, you know, which one flies the furthest. Which one do you want to fly the furthest? You know, that's a hilarious question. I've been actually debating that for the last two years because I also have a full time job. Oh really? Yeah, and and so uh, I'm in manufacturing pretty much, and and it's a condensed work schedule, which gives me a lot of freedom for music and real estate. But it's like, you know, of these three, which one do I want to go for the next fifty years? Mm. And then it's like, well, of those three, do I only want two of them to keep going? Do I only want one of them? Do I want all three of them? And it's it's this crazy debate. So I don't know. I, I would like to think that real estate and music is probably going to be what's still with me when i'm 60 that's great uh especially because the real estate you, you build all that wealth for yourself and then uh, you can do wondrous things with that as well i'm gonna try <laughs> so back to so you have a full-time job how do you balance all of that yeah so that's uh i'm asked that a lot so my weekend job which is full-time but it's a condensed schedule so i work overnight 32 hours a weekend and so that opens me up, essentially, business hours and more Monday through Friday, you know. And, of course, I have a little girl at home. She's uh, she's five, and I have her Monday through Friday. So it's nice because okay. I don't work when I, I have her. So she gets me, like, I'm hot and fresh. You know, I'm I'm not, you know, miserable after a 12-hour shift, and now i got to do dinner and groceries and laundry and put her to bed. No, it's like I'm, I'm there 100%. And then I have – I do all my music business while she's in school uh, during the week, and then – you know, on the occasional Thursday or Wednesday show, you know, maybe I can bring her to the show uh, with a friend. And if I can't, you know, my mom's awesome. She'll watch her. And so I have a good network of people that can watch her that really support her because she needs more people in her life than just me. Of course. But supports me being able to go out and, and do all this music. And then, of course, I'll, I'll have a show every Friday for the last, like, two years. I go to the show and I, I go, thank you. And then I run to work. Right. You know what I mean? And then Saturday, Sundays, I'll have, like, a lunchtime show so i'll go home after work in an eight or 12 hour shift i'll sleep for like three hours i'll get up do a show come home sleep for like two hours and then go to work for another 12 and then do it again the next day 
So sometimes my weekends are a little insane, but, uh, you know, thank goodness. Like that's what helps me get, you know, a hundred shows a year is doing some wild scheduling like that. And, uh, yeah, I was going to say, cause finding a show Monday through Friday, Friday, obviously is, you know, you always can get a show on Friday, Yeah. but throughout the rest of the week, that must be hard to find. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I've gotten, I'm a part of a lot of these Facebook groups that are like do it yourself, like tour and original music heavy. And so I've done a show every day of the week. Uh, and so, like, last year I went to Ohio, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Virginia, and I was doing these wacky, like, Tuesday shows. Wednesday morning at a farmer's market, and then Wednesday night a four-hour show at a, a fancy restaurant on the beach, like, you know. And so I've just been very lucky to find some cool day shows, like weekday shows, and then have met some awesome people doing it. And how did you set up that tour how did you find uh those places why did you want to go on tour uh, well definitely I wanted to go on tour for the experience to see what that's like you know and having a job and being in real estate it's kind of gives me an advantage in this music scene because it's like i don't need to music doesn't need to pay me in order to eat you mm -hmm. know what i mean so i have this really unique advantage where it's like i can go lose 300 bucks to go on tour you know and so oh driving to ohio because a friend of a friend with posted that they were looking for like an opening act or whatever it's like yeah i'll do that it's a tuesday that, that'd be so cool and so i'll drive six hours to ohio and then i'll meet you know touring bands there that are like hey we're playing in new york you know you want to jump on that bill and i'm like when and they're like wednesday i'm like yeah you know and so it's kind of cool so of course I, I almost feel like this the the old dad at when i'm touring with these bands because they have all their merch tables and i didn't have merch like I'm just now getting my merch in, you know, this year. So when I was doing all these tours, they're like, "Oh, here's your merch, you know, area." And I'm like, "I don't, I don't have any." And they're like, "What?" And I'm like, "Don't worry about it." And then I'm buying all the merch from the other bands because they're just so cool and they're like good to listen to and all that stuff. And so, see, so yeah, I'm just using Facebook groups and, and networking to to find these like tour dates, and you know, it, it's been a blast. That's awesome. What are some of the most favorite bands that you've played with so far? Oh, Skeleton Drive, hands down. Uh, what a cool person uh, they are. Um, they're great. They're actually coming. Uh, they're going to play a show with me in Pennsylvania, actually. They're coming from Ohio. Oh, wow. Yeah, I met them in Canton at Busman Art and Music Shops at their old location. It was like this. They had two bars. It was a music store, but they had two bars and this horseshoe and a massive stage. And it was the coolest decorated place ever. And so they played there, and, and they were so humble. So they're playing... Uh, third weekend of March, it's a Friday at Sakani Creek in Kutztown. They're making the drive down, and they're going to play. I've also toured at the Rage Tones, which is a Colorado band, and they're like sad, like funky stuff. Like they, it's like a, a sad guitar and keyboard, but also a saxophone. But also a saxophone. Right? And they tour all the time. But I, I've also hung out with like you know uh, Astronauts Exposed and uh, a, a couple other ones that are just fantastic. Uh, up there i've met too many acts to, to count but i would say the rage stones and skeleton drive are probably my two uh you know closest you know band mates at this point that's awesome so i kind of want to get into your music a little bit sure we have three of your songs mm -hmm. the first one that i want to play is uh 2300 yeah what is that about tell me about the songwriting <laughs> process for that so th this was brutal the songwriting process not in it was difficult but i, I was not uh, as great a well let, let's say i was still in a work in progress mm -hmm. much more than i am now we're always a work in progress but whew, i had a lot of work to do in high school and i was with this girl this, this poor girl uh and we both had we were in a relationship and we knew i was moving to florida and this was back before your gps was in your pocket so i, I mistakenly thought that it was 2300 miles from where i was in massachusetts it was actually 1500 but you know we don't need to know that 23 sounds better anyway right and uh so i wrote this song while in a relationship and the whole thing is about like you know we're breaking up and i'm i'm already in my head in florida i'm already 2300 miles away mm -hmm. and this poor girl I, I i was like hey i wrote this song and she's like oh yeah great let me hear it and so i played her this song which was a breakup song about her and she was like yeah that's that's a pretty good song i was like cool i'm glad you think so and so awkwardly we broke up like a month later so <laughs> Which is not, by the way, the first song that it's been a breakup song that I've written while with somebody and then showed them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But it's not like, here's a song, by the way, we're done. It's just like, here's a song. And they're like, nice. 
I'm like, huh? Did they ever figure it out that it was about that? No. Or? It's like I'm screaming this is not working and expressing it in a way that I know how. Now, I just verbally, I can very much be like, hey, I'm dissatisfied. We got to get out of here. But then that I, I didn't have the communication skills. So, yeah, so this is a song about me being already in my mind broken up in, in the new chapter in my life, which was in Florida from Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about a girl. This is 2300 by Tommy P. There was a time where I said I love you. I do. I love the the very punch you in the face intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just um, because it's out of nowhere, and I assume that that's kind of how it was. Mm -hmm. Just out of nowhere. Okay, I'm doing this. I'm away from you. Sorry, but here it is. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was this weird moving on from a chapter. It was like. You know, there was a time where I, I said I love you and I, I said I miss you. And it's like, and I do, but I'm 2,300 miles away. Like, at the time, mentally and figuratively. And then a few months later, literally, I moved to Florida. So I moved to Florida. Uh, so my grandmother is, is a huge inspiration of how to I just live my life. Because she's very smart. She's crazy. And Omar, if you're watching this, you you know. <laughs> you're crazy. And that's what I love about it, because uh, she's also one of the smartest humans I've ever met. Mm. And so even back then, she was very much, uh, she just beat, like, the, the being professional into me. You know, she was like, you never swear at interviews. You always, you never wear jeans at, in an interview. You, you know, this is how you present yourself and carry yourself. And weirdly enough, at, like, 17, like, I, I just, I listened anyway for some reason. 
And that's, uh, that's props to you. Yeah, I oh, I got lucky because I, I didn't listen often. I wish I listened more. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, she would drag me to church too on Sundays and and make me and my grandfather dress up like the the same. You know, she bought us the same pair of khakis and the same shirts. Like it was embarrassing then and now. But um, yeah. So she told me from you know most of my middle school and high school life, like, hey, if you want to come to college, like move down to Florida with live with me and you know I'll help you out with school. I was like, yeah, okay. But then all of a sudden she called me like junior year of high school and was like, hey, we we should make plans for you to move down. And it it became real, you know. And then the following year, you know, I had this girlfriend and it was like well, we know I'm moving down anyway, and this isn't working out anyway. Mm. And we're not going to do this long-distance thing anyway. And so, yeah, I think we broke up in, like, April. I moved in August of 2011. Yeah, it's it's always a, it's always a shame where... But it's also a blessing that you get to move away emotionally and physically, right? Yeah, uh, what a, yeah, what a blessing that I was able to go to Florida. I mean, I learned so much. It was so freeing. It was... Just those three and a half years largely were incredible. And just to add a point on to your grandmother's point of professionalism, especially in the music industry, mm-hmm. uh, granted, there are, there, you know, depending on your genre, there is the standard dress up. Like if you're, if you're a cowboy country singer, you got to wear the hat, you got to yep. wear the sunglasses, got to wear the, the stirrups and the boots and all that, all the get up. Yep. Right. But. And if you're, you know, if you're a punk head, you got to wear, you know, have the crazy hairstyle or wear, wear the Nirvana or whatever uh, T-shirt. You know, there's make sure you're dressed for your occasion. Mm-hmm. No, I totally agree. Like, I wouldn't really get away with this in the punk no. genre. You know what I mean? Like, no. I, I can't dress like this and look like this and say I'm punk. I'm, so, <laughs> I, I'm really surprised. Uh, you know, have you ever heard of Nardwall? Yeah. I'm surprised he gets away with this stuff either. You know, every now and again, you get one. Right, right, and um, even Elton John, really, uh, yeah, all the crazy stuff he's done, um, to his credit, not to his, uh, not to shame him at all, because right. I'm biggest fan of Elton John, but um, I wonder what she would, what your grandmother would think with your suits nowadays. I think she likes them. Yeah, yeah, I'd, but she's still around. Yeah. Oh, awesome! Yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank God she's uh not quite eighty, but she is still she's still around and alive and kicking and, and very quick to give me her opinion on uh, lots of things. And it's, it's great. No, she does like the suits and the dress up, uh, but the, the rare show that maybe it's a benefit outside in the rain or something like that. And, and I wear like ripped jeans and a flannel. Oh, she hates ripped jeans. Oh really? Oh man. Yeah. I'll get like nasty comments, like throw those damn jeans away. And then, you know, I'll get a text message like, what are you doing in those jeans? I thought I threw them all away when you lived here. <laughs> You know, I'm like, well, I bought nice jeans, and then, you know, they got ripped over time, and, yeah, I think they're cool. And she was like, they're gross. <laughs> so she, she likes the suits, uh, not so much the tattoos or the ripped jeans. Yeah, well, to each her own at some point, right? Yeah. And uh, last point, uh, people who are crazy are oftentimes smart as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see so. that, and she's no exception. She's uh, she's a very smart, tough lady. Yeah, yeah, getting on her bad side's not good. And that's why we stay happy and healthy all the time, right? <laughs> as much as we can. So you're in Florida. Why? How do you get to PA? Oh, that's a uh, that's a good question. Yeah, because Florida was great. Uh, yeah, right. Why would you leave? Well, minus the hurricanes and gators. well, actually, it was nice where we were at. I was like Central Gulf side, mm. and so we were like kind of elevated too. So we weren't too much in a big trouble area with hurricanes. Like they'd come through anyway, but we just got like a lot of like wind and rain, but not like devastation. Okay. And so, nice. they, yeah, <laughs> it was very nice. Um, no, oh my God, you can't shovel sunshine. So I like that about <laughs> Florida. You know, my dad <laughs> said, why would you move to Florida? That's what I told him. And uh, What a good quote, you can't shovel sunshine. Can't shovel sunshine. And uh, man, I, I love the sunshine. So no, yeah, I got to admit, it, it, when I put PA up to Florida, like Florida every time, you know, like if I could go back, like if I didn't have, you know, a kid, and of course, her, her mom is still around and in the picture, and that's great. But she lives here. She's not moving. And mm. so I'm not even bringing up the possibility of, okay, me and the kid live in Florida. Like, we're not even doing that, right? But, right. you know, if that wasn't a situation, I, I'd probably be back in Florida right now. But being that I'm up here, and to your question, you know, what brought me here was the economy. And before that, my mom from Massachusetts moved to Pennsylvania before I moved to Florida by like a year. 
And then, so when the economy just wasn't doing it for me at, you know, 20 years old in Florida and I couldn't get a full-time job and I had goals to like buy a house and, you know, get married and all these things. And, and of course I was in a relationship then, which another song came out of that. Uh, you know, it was like, well, the relationship's not working. The economy's not working. I got my associates. My mom's given me an opportunity saying, you know, Hey, the economy up here is great. You can move up here. And so I did. And then I'd never left. And when I moved up, it, it wasn't originally intending to move up. You know, I had a couple months worth of bills. I was ready to go see my family in Massachusetts and all that stuff. But now I went to her house and she had, you know, like a street sign on, on the door that said Tommy's room. And I was like, oh, geez. And so I just kind of landed there and, and stayed here. And, of course, I got a full-time job immediately and the economy is great. So it's like I can afford to live here and it's I'm being able – I'm accomplishing the goals that I wanted in Florida – on top of that now, I have an awesome kid and a music career that's very fulfilling. So it's this weird thing where it's like, wow, you know, plus, you know, I'm building, I'm trying to build a real estate empire up here too. So it's like, I have so much here. Uh, I just don't have uh, good food to eat, typically speaking, and uh, there's snow. And I don't like that, you know, but it is what it is. So I'm glad to be here for a lot of reasons. Yeah, it's really, that was kind of one of the main reasons why I moved up here. I don't know if I told you this, but I'm originally mm -hmm. from uh, Salisbury, Maryland. Are you? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I moved up here because, if you're familiar with the area, all they have is Ocean City. Yeah. And then, like, the White Comic Go Civic Center. Yeah. And that's about it for, like, music. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, I moved up here because, you know, the economy is better. Uh, I'd, I'd argue, granted, Delaware is, like, a chicken city. Uh, <laughs> but up here, you can't, there's so much, so many farmer markets. Yeah. And they're all relatively cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very cool. And, and there's a lot of, you know, Perry County style things up here, you know, yeah. in that it's very much like grow your own and, and feed your people. And, you know, it's not corporatized and it's not, you know, that's giant cool. stores, you know. So it's, it is, that's a huge factor here that I like. And that to the music scene as well. Everyone, yeah. everyone likes working with each other. I know so many, like, like you said, Alexia Christian worked with you. She's worked with me. She's worked mm -hmm. with everybody, in, uh, just about everybody in her circle. Uh, and, you know, we have nothing but great things to say about each other. Granted, if you're going to act a fool, people are going to know. Yeah. But that's all part of the healthy system that we, that in the networking that we go around here. But Central Pennsylvania is such a great place for musicians to really take off, I believe. And because, you know, New York's three hours away. Philly is an hour D.C., Baltimore area, two, two and a half hours. Even Pittsburgh, it's a drive, but it's four hours. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I mean, you know, and I'm sure I'm just one of many stories, but, you know, it's I started here, and it's taken off bigger than I would have thought. Like, you know, I, I thought I was going to do five shows in 2021 and get kicked out of the scene properly, you know, and here I am at 100 a year. It's like, well, something's going on here. But also, because of the scene, and to your point, there's – it's a good way to get started, but there's also so much talent. Mm -hmm. uh, I've grown so much. I mean, just from being around this area and I'm a Facebook stalker. So like if you're a musician and you're playing, I know about it and especially around here. And so, you know, I'm just stalking their Facebook pages. Like what does their act look like compared to mine? Cause I don't compare people to people cause we're all people and we're all you people. know, we're born and we're going to die and that's it. But in the meantime, it's like, well, what are they doing? Like, you know, and that translates to anything like, you know, is this guy a better carpenter than me? Why? Why? You know, what can I learn from that? So, like, when I started this, I'm, like, just watching Colby Dove in every move he makes. And I'm, like, how do I get my act there? You know, how do I do that? And then, like, Dave Gates, like we were talking about off air, it's, like, well, that guy's got something special. How do I how do I get my act to that level, you know? And there's so many people here, and that's only a couple. There's so many in central Pennsylvania where it's, like, their acts are something very special. And in Maryland, a shout-out to uh, – and he plays around here, too. Shout-out to Kevin Coa. I don't know if you've heard of him. It sounds familiar. His act is that that's like next level for me. I'm like looking at him right now going, whoa, he's got a this amazing pedal board with so many loops and his sound is tight and now he's got a synthesizer on top. And I'm like, mm. oh, oh, I'm coming for that. I love that. And um, another added to your point, everyone's willing to work with each other. Yeah. If oh, they have largely, time, right? yeah. So it is a great spot to network. To And these people, like, if you're in the loop, They'll say, hey, I can't make this gig. Can you fill in for me? Yeah, I, it's so funny. I've literally done that. Right, and it, and they're all for it. Everyone here supports each other. Yep. There are great people in this area to get in contact with. Everyone is in at least three different bands. right? <laughs> Pretty much. And they're, all, they're always, and somehow they're always willing to fit in one more or they're willing to work 
like uh, I know a bass player that that hops on to multiple different bands over the over the course of a month, and he just does it. Yeah, that's just the way they do. And there's some guitarists here that can just hop in your set and just wail without ever learning your piece at all. Yeah. Yeah, that's Eric Ryder right there. That guy can. Oh, my God. I'll shout out Mike Rosafi as well. Uh, incredible guitarist around here. Uh, it's If you want to be loved in the music scene around here, because Lancaster uh, Central PA loves its music. Absolutely. Loves yeah. its arts. Music for everyone is around here. You know, the Chameleon Club, that kind of set up this whole yeah I set the spot up on the map years ago <laughs> yeah uh, it's an incredible spot to be come out and check it out for sure we have another one of your songs up we have amy and chris yeah yeah what a special one this is so uh you know without lyrical prowess it's very direct so this is literally my dad chris and his uh partner in the 90s amy uh amy karen who's fantastic he's my guy that checked her guitars uh, and the reason why I play Schechter, but pretty much they were in a duo in the 90s, and they were, in, in my opinion, to this day, one of the best duos, if not the best that I've ever heard. And I'm a Simon and Garfunkel fan. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just their harmonies, their voices. Of course, my dad's singing, you can never go wrong. But then Amy's ability to write is insane. He writes such good music, seemingly with little effort. And so I'm a huge fan of the work, and I have, like, one of the last remaining, like, signed CDs of their, like, you know, original album and all that. And so that's a huge inspiration uh, to me. And so it's it's sad that they don't exist. And because it was pre-internet, they almost never did. Oh, no. You know, in the sense that you can't go back and watch hours of live recordings. It doesn't exist because we didn't have YouTube on our phones. Right. We didn't really have phones. You know, never mind anything else. So they're a band that, in a sense, never was and never will be again. And I have, like, ten of their songs and it's the best 10 songs on the planet. And so, yeah, the whole concept is, you know, even if I was blind, I could still hear their music. And uh, it, the whole song is about them. With that said, this is Amy and Chris by Tommy B. If I go blind, that'd be okay. Because I can still hear the really interesting chord progression i was listening to it uh <laughs> thank you especially the the slide up to uh oh, it just it just happened like like 30 minutes left 30 yep. minutes 30 seconds left into the song i know what you're talking about that's really that was really smooth and really cool thanks yeah that's uh that's just a, a c major with the pinky on the g note on the high e just being slid up to a a d a but d. there's that extra note that shouldn't be there so it's it's a d something i don't know if it's a sus4 or not i can't think about it it's really cool though thank you and then yeah, yeah it's just 12 string picking at that point so how do you, dude your calluses must be rough yeah on this hand i can't operate touch devices if they're wow. if they're heat sensitive 
you know, there's there's heat and then there's pressure. Right. And so, like, my grandmother had a touch lamp, and I would just tap it, and it would, like, move, like, every, like, ninth tap. And then I would do this with all my fingers, and it would move, like, you know, it would be, like, flip, flip. And then I, I'd go over here with this finger, and it would go flash, 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 because they're so thick. Because what I did when I started playing guitar is I wasn't used to them, and they'd start chipping, and I'd rip them off. Mm. And then it would just be, like, this raw underneath skin. And then I'm like, well, I still want to play guitar. And so I'd go through the pain of that, and then that would build a callus, and then the other skin would heal over it, and then I'd rip that off. And so my calluses are too deep it's probably not healthy (laughs) that's incredible uh that's that's like one the one thing that's stopping me from playing guitar is is the callus i I played bass like a week ago Mm -hmm. and my fingers are still recovering from that almost like it's like still yeah i would say it it took me probably four years to get through the 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 pain and the bleeding and the the ripping your calluses off uh so now if i have any chip on my callus i I try to leave it alone Mm. you know but now even if i do like rip it it's not at the end of the world. Yeah, but yeah, it was probably five solid years of wow. This is just the most painful hobby I could have. And uh, I just want to shout out. There is a, a local guy here who made a a solution for that. It's called oh. the, the Musician's Practice Glove. I'm not sponsored by him or anything, but I just really love his product. Okay, what it, is it? It's a, it's a glove that goes right over your hand. It's like it's almost like a a marching band glove, for example. Okay. Um, it's it uh. You know, protects your calluses. When you're done, it still gives a really great tone. I've been using it a lot, actually. Okay. Um, and he, he gave me a free sample, and uh, it's really good. It's actually endorsed by some of the, uh, like, one of the top guitarists, I think, in the UK. I can't remember his name at the moment. Uh, but uh, it's, it, you know, it's cooling. So you don't, you don't get sweaty hands underneath there, so that's really cool. Okay. And uh, especially if you have arthritis as well, it helps with that, too. Hmm. Um, and... So I, I can't. Don uh, Grabowski is the is the guy who invented it. And he's right. He's centered right here at a, at a PA. It's the musicians practice glove. It's really cool. I highly recommend it for people who are just starting who don't have calluses to build up and they can't play like hours on end to practice like you you need to do for any instrument. Uh, so I, that's what I've been kind of working on now is uh, when when I have time, uh, just slip on the the glove and work on it. That's cool. I mean, I would try it. I mean, I have the calluses, but just to try the product, I would try it. Right, just to try the product. And they're only like five bucks or something. Oh, okay. So it's, so it's like really simple, really, really easy. And they have like, like flesh colored ones too. So it doesn't look only... like you're cheating on stage. Yeah, right. Case. Yeah. So if ever you have a callus break on stage, you just put the glove on and continue to show. That'd be cool. Yeah. So I just have to shout them, them out real quick. So, but, uh, so you use a looping device. What what more? You you keep talking about how much you want to add to your act. If you could have the dream act, what would it be? Well, that's a good question. I've been thinking about that a lot. So, you know, I mentioned Kevin Coa's device earlier. I would probably say his rig, but tailored to my act, plus the cajon and the, the foot tambourine that I already do and, and have. So, and of course, I, I play a 12 uh, acoustic. He plays largely a six electric i'm sure he could play anything but you know that's what i've seen of him and so yeah what i'd like is boss makes this really incredible looper where you could plug in like three to like five different instruments and loop them individually while you're playing the other ones you could just trigger you know if i'm playing guitar and singing in cajon and tambourine and all that stuff i could just have the i could click a button and just the guitar will loop or i could click a button and everything will start recording for a loop i want that plus a synthesizer Plus my cowbell. I, I don't love having the cowbell, but everywhere I go, they like freak out. They're like, oh, that's hilarious. You got to keep the cowbell. So I bring it for the audience. There's but, always more cowbell. Yeah. Oh, I just learned cowbell. that Don't Fear the Reaper song, too, by popular demand. They're like, you can't have a cowbell and not learn that song. And yes. so I learned it. But I finger pick it because I'm, I'm not good with a flat pick. So I would say his like boss station I would really like, plus a, a synthesizer. I would love that because it just looks great and it would feel great, especially with all the loops that you could do while I'm playing percussion with my feet or hand, depending on what I'm doing, because I could play all of that and then, you know, pl- be on the yeah. synthesizer at the same time. Dude, that would be insane. So that that would be, like, my ultimate ultimate act. Do uh, you ever have any plans to add a harmonica or anything, like? I don't yet. Now, I've thought about it, you know, and it's like, well, of all the songs that I play, how many would be worth a harmonica? And on my set list currently, 
uh, zero. Well, I mean, minus Piano Man, but it's also, I don't like playing that song live. I don't put it by request because it's mm-hmm. like, it's Piano Man. I'm playing guitar. And so this already this is all work. wrong. Yeah, it's all wrong. And then, you know, for a song about a piano man, it's like, yo, that harmonica sure likes to be ahead of everyone. Like, yeah, right. So I don't know, but I could. I have played harmonica, um, but I'm definitely not a harmonica player. So it's it's on the table, but it's not like on the front burner, you know. So we have one more song as we're kind of rounding out our time here. If you guys have any questions, please be sure to. Ask them in the, in the comments and we'll get around to it. We have I Know, <laughs> this last one. Tell me about that. Uh, so it's on the album, it's probably going to get renamed Passive Aggression, but um, I was going for a concept that I later changed. But the song itself is, oh, I guess about another girl. There's a lot of, there's a lot of songs about girlfriends on this. You know, I was dating a girl and I, I felt... And in hindsight, it seemed that she was, like, leading me on and all that stuff. And, like, mm. that was kind of annoying, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, I just wrote this whole thing. But before you play it, I do got to ask you, do you have, like, a uh, like a, like a a language barrier? Because there was one curse word at the end of the song. Uh, what curse word is that? It's the big one. It's the F-bomb. Oh, dear. Um, I can hit mute, if you'd like, right when that part shows up. We're on the radio, so I can't play that song. That's fair. You want to yeah. go? Uh, you want to go? Maybe like two minutes in. Two and kill minutes it? in and kill it. Can I do that? That is a great question. I don't know if I can. Hmm. Uh, we'll we'll try to figure that out. But so tell me, uh, tell me more about the song, and then I'll I'll hit it when it hits past uh, two. Mi- it'll be uh, two minutes left. Oh, I'd recommend the first two minutes. Oh, you'd recommend the first two minutes. Okay. Yeah. We can do that then. I'm glad I brought it up because I know you're live, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, so this is, I know we're going to cut it a little bit short, but that's okay. You can, yeah. you can check it out when it comes out. Yep, and of course I'll be posting the release dates uh, as soon as I get one, which might be today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, with that said, this is currently I Know yep. by Tommy B. advertise you play to my heart there must have been misunderstandings you tried to tear me apart but not this time but maybe not this time That was <laughs> I know, and that was when you were fifteen, four, four uh, what, fourteen, fifteen. What was it? Yeah. So this song is was a, a fun project to record because it it flips, flops back and forth between fifteen four and sixteen four, the whole song, and then of course that breakdown uh, was in six eight, mm-hmm. and then of course it goes back to this fifteen four, sixteen four baloney, you know, and then it ends with a, a seven eight ending like a real quick but it's just this nice loud you know charging seven eight ending and uh, i didn't write it intentionally like that it just happened <laughs> fair enough it, we, we were, it was kind of funny we were talking about the the ukulele it almost sounded like sweet child of mine yeah i'm gonna have to go to that. back to the drawing board on that one well i mean you don't have to change it it's, it's just really cool that uh because i've never heard that on a ukulele i was like that reminds me so much of 
uh, switch out of mine. A little unintentional nod to the greats. Yeah, absolutely, man. So what are some of the upcoming shows that you have going on right now, and where can people find you? Oh, okay. Well, uh, let's start with where people can find me. Everything that you can imagine. If I'm on it, it's at Tommy B Entertainment. So Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, and soon, you know, Apple Music in the works is at Tommy B Entertainment. And that's T-O-M-M-Y-B. Yep. B is in Boston, mm -hmm. Tommy B, and then Entertainment. Because Tommy B Music uh, couldn't get on all things. Oh, even the website, TommyBEntertainment.com. You know, so it, it's all that. So the branding's there. But, um, yeah, shows I have coming up. What's today? Thursday? Well, tomorrow I have my second Broken Rib show uh, at Zykin de Ferdes in Hanover. And I say that because I broke my left eighth rib on January 8th. And it's it's still broke. It's it's not great. Yeah, it's, oh, no. it's better. But it's not, it's not there. So, uh, How did you break that? I think it was a combination of a, a bunch of things. It, it might have started at home or at work and then maybe going to the gym, doing mm. tricep extensions, probably really broke it. But I also didn't know it was a broken rib, and so I was sleeping on my left side, and so I could have broken it in my sleep. And uh, So anyway, it's broke. So yeah, I have my second broken rib show. Uh, shout out to Terry Ryder in advance for uh, coming to my house tomorrow to help me load and and load in the gear and, and hand over and all that stuff but then there's other exciting shows too i mean i'm playing i don't know like eight in february i'm doing a duo show with dave gates um february 5th in woodbine maryland that's gonna be mm. great that's a three to seven show and we've never played as a duo i mean we've practiced you know but that's gonna be incredible uh me and alexia christian in april have a duo coming up and so that's great and then of course i have a bunch of solo shows all on on a website and particularly on facebook.com slash Tommy B Entertainment. It will be my full schedule and all that stuff. Well, so getting to our final questions that I'd like to ask all of our guests, what is one of the best pieces of advice that you have ever been given? Oh, that I've ever been given? Oh, man. Uh, I guess jokingly, but also with a serious tone. Maybe Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> you know, his advice, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I can't. laughs> uh, despite how funny that is, you are not wrong, it, especially for us musicians who get all in our head about, oh, should we do this, or is this going to be acceptable, people going to like this, right. uh, I got to change that reverb just a little bit, or, you know, whatever, yep. I got to change the sound of the snare, the pop, or whatever. It, even starting this show, mm -hmm. for me, it, I had so many things going on, oh, I'm going to have to buy all this equipment, oh, where am I going to do it, blah, blah, blah. Right. I'm not, I'm not going to have, even when I got the spot, oh, the, the camera, it's low quality, or, oh, mm -hmm. there's only one shot, or, oh, I can't, I can't do this, this, and that to make this better. Who cares? You just do it. Start. <laughs> start. But, start uh, somewhere. I would say my dad probably gave me the best uh, honest advice when I was literally asking about the music scene. Of course, he's been playing, you know, he's in his 50s now. He's been playing his whole life, and he's been playing in bars. He was playing six nights a week, you know, two on Sundays, like, you know, back when he was with Amy. And he still plays a ton. And, you know, I asked him, like, you know, what, what do you do when you mess up? You know, like, how do you, like, what happens? Like, how, how does the show go on when it was an obvious mess up? You know, like, I gave him an example. I was like, you know, I was at the Valley Tavern playing uh, Cats in the Cradle, and I, I destroyed the first verse. And I was like, well, let me come back to it. And, and I tried hitting again, and I messed up. And then, so I looped some stuff, pulled it up on my iPad, and then I'm reading it. And, and I messed up reading it. And I was like, wow. You know, and I finally got through it. But, you know, so asking like that, like, how do you recover from clear, blatant, you just destroyed something bad? And he said, uh, with more ex expletives, he said, nobody cares. N not at all. And, and I really didn't believe that at the time, well, before that. But when he told me it made sense, he goes, the only person that's going to give you any kind of, uh, you know, heckling or, or, or shade for making a mistake is that jerk musician in the back who would, who's just mad that they're not up on stage where you are. And that was really interesting. He probably said that around my 30th show solo. And now that I've got hundreds under the belt, it's like, wow, is he right? You know, and I've seen it with other musicians, you know, maybe I go to watch a musician and they make a mistake and I catch it. And I'm very conscious of like my body language. So if there's a mistake now, I used to be like, you know, I, that's every musician ever. Yeah, whenever they hear a mistake or something that something that was slightly off pitch. <laughs> yeah, right, off pitch or the wrong word or like he went into the wrong verse or you know what I mean, she or they or whatever. And so now it's like you know, I'll be like eating a, a chicken wing, like 
<laughs> you know, I'll just kind of hesitate. Pause. But then I started looking around, like while I'm at watching another musician, I, I turn around, I have my back to the musician so I can watch the crowd as they're playing to see what that looks like from, you know, not playing his perspective. Nobody knows. Yeah, nobody knows. They're having a good time. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. And so uh, that that's the best advice. Like, you know, couple that with like, okay, the audience doesn't care if you make a mistake. They probably don't know. And most of them aren't musicians anyway. Because if they were mostly musicians, your audience would not be heavy because they'd all be playing on a Friday or a Saturday night anyway. Exactly. And so, so that's what you're dealing with. And they're generally friendly anyway. But couple that with still try to be the best you you can be. You know, he didn't give me that advice, but... It keeps me humble. It's like, okay, nobody cares, but that that's not licensed to give out a poor product, you know? Right, of course. And uh, to add on to that point, the w- worst critic you're ever going to get is yourself anyway. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully. But the worst thing you can do when you make a mistake is acknowledge it. Yeah. That is one of the worst things you can ever do because now everybody knows, oh, you made a mistake. Right. Because you told us. And now we know you made a mistake, because uh, otherwise people got people got their own lives going on, right? They're they're eating, yep. they're talking, or whatever. They're just like, oh, this is nice music in the background. You could you, I bet you, you could be speaking gibberish, and they still wouldn't know. Yeah, I mean, largely, yeah. Though, of course, the flip side, I've had the rare occasion where, you know, I've, I've dropped a pick or I knocked over my cowbell or something, uh, That's or a like bit louder. Yeah, or like my loop got totally off and I had to like real quick switch gears for the loop and keep it going. Rarely I'll get somebody who like sees the disaster or maybe like I'll knock my microphone with my head and I'll have to catch it like mid chord, you know? Mm-hmm. And and that's just like a good wink and a nod and like a kind of like an off mic laugh. You know, like they saw it, I saw it. Because they saw it, I got to laugh it off. But yeah, 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 without somebody seeing it, I'm not bringing attention to it. Yeah, and, and if you do, everybody's human. People know that. Yeah. It's going to be fine. Just move on. That's the best thing you can do in that time. Just move on. Don't f- worry about the mistake because if you worry about the mistake, more are going to happen. Yeah, and you know what's funny? I mean, just talk about that for a moment. I mean, you know, number one, do it twice, call it jazz. No, I'm just kidding. Right. But uh, wrong. I used to get in the car. You know, I, One of my best friends used to come to like every show that I had when I was first starting out. And on stage, I would remember every mistake and tally them up as I made them, which I think was probably good for a small run of time then and then we get in a car and we would talk about every mistake i made and you know they'd point out a couple that maybe i didn't see or i'd mm-hmm. point out some that they didn't see and we'd analyze that and then i'd go home and work on those things you know but there was a flipping point and i think it was somewhere in the in the year 2022 where it was like you know i don't want to hear any of the mistakes that i made like at this point i know the ones that i made and i know i can do better but and now it's like just getting, you know, it's getting down. It's like, you know, we don't, how about 99% of that show was fire, you know? Right. Or how about like, you know, I got tipped like 200 bucks that night. Like, you know, I think that speaks more than the mistakes, you know? It's like they were singing and dancing. They didn't care. They had a good time and I entertained. Whether there was like mistakes in the song or not, I did my job and entertained the heck out of a crowd. And it's like that. That's so much more fulfilling. It's like, yeah, I'll always be a practicing musician, Mm -hmm. you know, striving to get better, but I'll never be perfect because who is? Who is? But it's like I entertained and the night was perfect, you know, and it's like, well, what's better than that? You know, on the other hand, you could have a perfect show and nobody cares. And it's like, well, did you entertain? Like, I'm not going there as a musical act. I'm going there to provide professional quality entertainment. How are they going to remember you? Yeah. You know, so I got the cowbell and some fancy other tricks and I wear ridiculous suits and that gets their attention enough to hopefully be a base level of engaged, even if they're talking or they're just taking pictures of like, oh, look at this guy. Like he looks ridiculous. And then it's like, well, now I can make goofy faces because I'm playing wagon wheel like everyone else, you know, like, yeah, maybe I'm I'm finger picking and they don't do that. Maybe I'm looping and they don't do that. Or maybe they do or maybe they do it better. But like, who cares? Because baseline, it's still. Still you. It's still the song, and it's still me. And so how do we build on that, you know? Like, what's 10 musicians playing the same cover song? Well, it's like, I'm going to make goofy faces and laugh at the crowd and give out Tommy B. Egg Shakers to children, you know what I mean? And and really make it special for individuals if I can. Yeah, making memories at a show is the one thing. Uh, and there's a point to be said, be yourself. 
Yeah. Because you don't want to be Darius Rucker because Darius Rucker is already Darius Rucker and no one's going to Darius Rucker harder than Darius Rucker, <laughs> right? Right. So why bother? I know so many musicians who play House of the Rising Sun the exact same way all the time, forever and ever, amen. Mm -hmm. What's the point? You can just go to Spotify and listen to it like that. Right. Right. And it's funny, me and Dave Gates were practicing the other day and we were just talking about this because... He was saying he's got a friend who, who kind of is critical of his act. Like, you know, hey, you, you don't play many of your songs right. Like, that's not mm -hmm. how they did it in the recording. That's not right. And then, you know, he was going, he's like, yeah, but this is me, and it works all the time. Right. And it's like, you know, same thing. Like, if I'm playing Wicked Game by Chris Isaac, I am finger pick shredding the heck out of four and a half minutes of music. And it's like, but if I played it like Chris Isaac, and you played it like Chris Isaac, and so did 20 other musicians. It's like, then who cares about the jukebox in the corner? Right. You know, it's like, oh, he's doing that song like that. That's crazy. You know, and people don't think about that. They just go, oh, what a great way to do the song. Exactly. And it's, and it's always pushing music in a certain way. You're going you're gonna to perform that piece in a different way, in a different style, and people might realize, oh, I actually really, really like that style. Yeah. I want to go out to more of his shows and see what other covers he does differently. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And so it's, I it's my biggest gripe when people musicians try to be other musicians because you you just can't. And right. People are gonna notice when you are trying, and they're gonna be turned off from that. They're gonna want something unique. They're gonna want something special. You have to, and that's how you get your, you know, everyone's gonna have their haters. Everyone's gonna, I don't like the, mm -hmm. but you're gonna find the genuine people that are gonna care about you and go to all your shows because they really like this way and they can't they can't wait to see what's next right you know they're, they're here and say you know wagon wheel but also nib by Sla uh, sabbath and many other songs in the universe of tommy b and so that for a lot of people is a cool thing just like you know all the songs that you could play in in your universe you know it, it's almost i think of it like uh you know throwback to nickelodeon like fairly odd parents and jimmy neutron had that mash over where you could see crossover ever. I'm saying, right? Uh, right. But you were able to see Jimmy Neutron in the universe of the Fairly Odd Parents. And it was, well, his was nice. The, the flip was a little bit rough. Right. But it, it was so cool that it you could so see cool. in this universe that's already a good product. What are these other things look like? And, and I feel like the same thing is, you know, with cover songs. You know, if we're, if I'm covering, you know, Black Sabbath, what's that look like under my umbrella versus yours versus. You know, Kagan Goldstein's versus, uh, you know, Black Sabbath. Right. You know? Their own, yeah. And it's it's the same song in a different umbrella, and it's it's the coolest thing, you know. It, so, yeah, I love when people do that, take it to their own world. Because to your point, if you try to be another musician, it's it's inauthentic. And I think authenticity is derived from truth. And I think whether it goes good or bad, the truth is going to be the better scenario. And music is driven by authenticity. Authenticity. Yeah. If you listen to any of the live albums that these musicians do, it's not the same as the as the studio recording. Right. It can't be. Right. It wouldn't be a good live aid. Would not be the best. You know, one of the best performances of all time by Freddie Mercury and Queen. Mm -hmm. If they did it the way they did in the studio. Yeah, I'm totally with you. So go make magic. Go do what you want. I got one last question for you. Okay, sure. What is one of the funniest or worst things that ever happened to you on a gig? <laughs> oh, man. I got a good one. Uh, uh, I'll do, I guess uh, I'll do two quick ones. Uh, the first one people still talk about, I did in like, I think the end of 2020. Now, yeah, the end of 2020, I did one. And then for Sherman's Creek Inn, I did. I think uh, in the beginning of 2021, I, uh, I dressed up fully as Wonder Woman. And people to this day come up to me and they're like, dude, you have the nicest legs I've ever seen. And I'm like, why are we even talking about this? I'm like, that was almost two years ago. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but like, how are your legs that nice? I'm like, well, it took two hours of prep to, you know, be able to fit in this costume and make it look like I was Wonder Woman. Because I, I go full tilt. You know, when we're off air, I'll show you a picture and you'll be like, wow, I can't believe that. But you got to go 100%. So that's funny. And, you know, being... Like if I'm in Carlisle, a lot of times people like randomly will either come up to me or walking by and they'll be like, Wonder Woman. And I'm like, how? You know, like I now have a mustache. How do you recognize I don't have a wig or makeup? What do you mean? So that's funny. I think the the worst thing that happened to me at a gig, honestly, was 
And, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the, the venue earlier, but, you know, not to tie it to the story. But I don't play there again. Uh, because if my whole act is professional quality entertainment and a venue is the antithesis of that, I don't think it's right for me to even be like, hey, I'm going to be, you know, at this venue. It's, you know, like if you got good food, like Buddy Boy Winery, I'm advertising that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just a fantastic place that I love, like Sherman's Creek Inn, I'm advertising that. Authenticity, you know what I mean? I'm not going to tell you to come to venue A for drinks and great service when it's the opposite. And so when I advertise professional quality entertainment and the venue is against that or it's not right it doesn't not jive. The, not it doesn't align. That, yeah. right i can't bring people there so i actually canceled shows last year for this venue because i was like i can't do that because what happened was i'm in the middle of playing like kathy's song by simon garfunkel i'm in the middle of this venue my back is to the wall there's tables everywhere and it's got a decent crowd and the owner's drinking like coors light like all the whole show like all day which is okay fine like i don't love that you know, I watch enough Bar Rescue where it's like maybe don't drink the entire time that you're on the clock. Never mind in front of, like, people. Like, you're there right. to work, and, you know, it's, like, great that you're using your own product, I guess, but it you don't need a drink in your hand. Right. And so, anyway, and, and so this guy, he's a big fan of mine. When I was there, I played there, like, six times. And, you know, he, he came up with another person that was just from the audience, and they were, like, fluffing their shirts. They're, like, you know, five feet in front of me, and they're, like, fluffing their shirts. I'm like, oh, here we go. I'm going to get flashed again at another show, right? Which is kind of cool, like, you know. I like rock and roll, like Ozzy Osbourne, like take tops off, like that's great. But also, I'm a solo acoustic act. Like this is strange. Like when I was Wonder <laughs> Woman, I get, I got a lot of people taking their tops off for the Wonder Woman thing, and that was hilarious. Right. But back to this venue, it was the owner who's a, who's a male, and there's some older woman there with him, and you know, they go one, two, three, and like the crowd's got their backs. They're not paying attention. They're drinking at the bar, and her shirt comes up, and you know everything comes out. I'm like, I mean, okay. You know, like, that's flattering, but wow. But he actually dropped his pants and, and fully flashed me whatever he had going on there. And I was I was like, wow. Like, I'm not offended by that. Like, I'm, you know, like, pro-nudity. Like, I'm a nudist. Like, it's different than sex. Like, it's right, just, right. you know, hey, you're born this way. It's great. But then I'm like, man, you're, you're drinking. This is illegal here. How unprofessional. And you have, like, all these, like, as you know. As the owner. As the owner, especially. And... It's like if you're treating me that like this because you know you don't know if I care or not. You know you just don't ask. Or yeah, you, right. right. Like we're not on this level. Like hey, wh I work for you, man, and you're you're flashing me. Like well, what are you doing to like all your female like bartenders? Mm. You know what I mean? Like how, are you making them comfortable? If you're willing to do that for me, that you've only known five shows, what are you doing to people that are on your payroll? And so I I went back and forth for like three weeks before I canceled the gig. I was like I just can't. That moment didn't offend me. But that moment offended my Brand. professional quality yeah. entertainment. And it was like, wow, I can't bring anybody here. Also, like, their food wasn't great and the drinks weren't good anyway. You know, so that that was like the final straw. I mean, they paid well, but it was like, that's, you can't pay enough to go against principle. Principle, yeah. And so that was probably the, I suppose, the worst thing. I have so many stories, but that was probably like the most shocking. Like, you own this bar. Like, that's illegal. Like, where's John Taffer? You know, <sighs> it was crazy. Well, that just goes to show for uh, musicians as well. And I can't stand, uh, I can't state this enough, uh, but it's never really been brought up on the podcast. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about it. Cool. Stay on your principles. Yeah. Like, like do not sell yourself out. If you're going to sell yourself out, this, you're going to get so much disrespect, so much. Uh, you're gonna fall down, fall down the list on so many people's lists. Yeah. Because you did not stand up for yourself. You didn't stand up to for your principles. You you didn't say you you just bent the knee and said, whatever they you know they they pay well whatever blah blah blah. blah. It's so much more meaningful, so much more powerful if you say, hey, I'm not doing this anymore because this goes past my boundaries. Mm -hmm. I'm a person. And I have a brand, you don't fit that, and I can't associate with you anymore. Yeah. And that's that's not a childish argument. Some, I mean, some, some people can be childish about that. But it's not a childish thing to have. It's a very adult thing to, to do. And granted, you're going to get people who say, oh, blah, 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 you're, you're just a hypocrite or you're just a, uh, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, whatever. They're going to call you all sorts of names. It's, it's a fake, whatever. 
your uh, party kill, whatever. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. You're right. That's on them. Yeah, it's all about the principle. It's all about the principle. You got to be able to tell your audience, hey, I want you to come out to this show. It's going to be me. And you don't need that to be a part of it, especially if you're uh, like, if I, well, I'm not going to assume, but I assume that your show is sometimes family, mostly family friendly. Yeah, I mean, depending on the venue, but yeah, yeah I mean, I could definitely tailor for that. So why would you be, a, you know, someone who's, who might be known as a family friendly or a, uh, a professional act? Mm-hmm be telling people to go to go to the show where the you know the bar owner or any any of their staff really is an unprofessional clown. Yeah, it's like I'd play like a triple X show no problem, but I'd advertise it as such. Right. You know, and so just going to like a, a family bar and tavern, it's like, hey, I can't play there. And it's funny, I've actually seen a, a handful of musicians book there. I've seen like, oh, you know, new venue I'm playing here. And I'm like, hey, you do you. I know you weren't there and you don't know and I'm not talking poorly and maybe things have changed i don't play there because of this and i think it's at least worth you hearing the story and they go okay and you know it's funny now that i'm thinking about it i've not seen advertisements from those musicians playing there i'm just thinking of that now like oh wow that's wild and listen uh, always be sure to tell your musicians about you know past bad things that have happened because if not only does it it's it's being what's the word it's being uh, holding those places accountable for for their actions. Yeah, because if if they don't, if they're not getting any income from uh, musicians and the audiences they bring, they're gonna realize, oh. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine in theory if all of a sudden they have a hard time finding professional quality musicians on say like a Friday night because of this story, and then all the musicians that I'm telling, and then the musicians that they're telling, and so now like the the pool of musicians that they might have are low quality and then okay so then you know going to this place on a friday night you're gonna get low quality entertainment like that's just it going down the road a a couple more steps and probably where it is but like as a venue owner why would you ever want that right you know and so many so many venues get away with so much baloney yeah because we're you know we're not the big time artists we're we're the small town uh local artist we can treat them like trash because there's a billion of them no, right. can't do that. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. I firmly believe, uh, like how I started, if I only provide professional quality entertainment and, uh, you know, I stick to principles, you know, so not tolerating kind of that stuff, you know, and any other weird baloney that could go on, uh, you know, I'm either going to succeed or fail, but I'm, I think I'm more likely to succeed and I would rather a truthful uh success that was founded in uh principle than you know a, a less often uh, a less authentic success that you know i i overlooked my morals on right like, you know can you imagine that like you because then how do you feel at the top you know probably dirty but i'd rather feel good at the bottom right clean <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and besides all that stuff in the future will drag down your uh reputation amongst your fans yeah because People will find, <laughs> sorry, people will find out. Yeah, absolutely. If you mess around, you know the saying is mess around and find out, mm-hmm. and it, it's so true, especially for musicians. It's so easy to mess around as musicians, right? Yeah. And people are gonna know. It's better to stay on principle, stay clean, stay, stay as fresh. It doesn't matter if you go up or down. It doesn't matter. You're doing what you love, mm-hmm. and that's the point. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Anything else to say? Yeah, I do have a question for you if you oh, if sure. you'd like to field a question. Sure. So so here's a here's a good one in the music community right now. How do you feel about musicians um, or venues presenting contracts for bookings? So for example, you book me for January 27th, uh, and I say, "Great, I'll send you over a contract. Just please sign it." And and maybe in there there's like a cancellation clause or something mm-hmm. like that. You know. And, you know, there's a time and date and all that stuff. So that way, if some baloney happens, you know, you, I can say, hey, you know, in this clause, if you cancel me within a week, you owe me 75 bucks or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Insert the numbers, whatever. How do you feel about the concept of contracts? On a local scene? Yeah. On a local scene? It, I, you know, that's a really great question because I can see the usefulness of that. However... 
people are gonna ha- get have to get, get real cool with a lot of things real quickly, <laughs> right? Because we all know musicians. It's like herding cats. Yeah. Right. Uh, and especially in the local scene, these musicians aren't always, you know, their music isn't their priority, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess in that way, it'd be a good a good thing to weed out those people, right? And uh, it would be a, a great thing for those people who who really need to get a slap in the face and learn what's going on. It'd be a really great chance for them as well to get their act together and, you know, be more professional. And that'll probably launch their career further. Uh, but I don't know, man. There's so many things that can happen, right? There's yeah. so many things that can happen. Yeah. You could get a bus tire. You could get... You could get, you know, you know, COVID still around. You can get that. You can get the flu. You can get whatever sickness that, you know, they would have. I, I, and at that point, you, I, uh, depending on how long the contract is and whatever the terms are, you'd probably have to get some sort of lawyer to look at that ovary for you because I, I think venues, especially the larger ones, would take advantage of, of the, the lower musicians. They could. So you're saying if a venue has a contract, they could take advantage of, you yeah. know, like upcoming musicians? I think so. Yeah, I mean, you got a point. And that, that's why I wanted to ask you this question because it's kind of a hot topic because I, I have a, a venue that I just got 12 of my shows canceled for this year. Now, listen, I'm going to eat and rebook them anyway. I don't care, right? right. But, and I, I, I don't know, I get like 10 to 15 cancellations a year, which, I mean, you know, when you're booking 120 and you it have happens. 15, it happens. But And some of them are, you know, the entire event got canceled, you know, or whatever. And now, listen, if we had a contract and I said, well, hey, you know, you got to pay me at least half of the agreed amount, if you cancel for, you know, a few reasons, you know, barring crazy things, right? Mm-hmm. You know, then, I mean, even if I get stiffed, I'm not going to get a lawyer, right? But at least right. having a piece of paper, like, hey, you owe me this. We could take it further, right? But for, like, a one-off venue, I don't care. I'm not eating on it. But for the, the musicians, that all they do is music, right? I think it could help them. Yeah. And especially in the case, like, if someone's playing 200 shows a year and 12 of them get canceled like that and now they're not making their two to 3,000 bucks on that in a year, it's like, oh, what? man. So, so I don't know. So it's, that's, that's why it's just a question because I don't have an answer. I don't even have an a, opinion. I just have a, well, from this angle, this, from this angle, that. And so I like where you're coming from too. Yeah, well, if, if the musicians were the ones to start that contract, like if – I guess that's what you're you were originally thinking. Well, it could go either way, but yeah, say say musicians. But it, so if a musician said, "Okay, here's here's my term list, here's my term sheet for this venue," I'd be more open to that because that that gives you know the musician more power to start off with. Yeah, I like that. Right. So and and you know, of course, everybody knows you know you do the big ask and then you you negotiate to what the you know what your actual is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I feel like that'd be more more genuine and more. Uh, productive and probably more profitable for musicians uh because they can say hey i want 500 bucks to play uh venue a and uh venue a is like oh 500 bucks we only you know normally play 200 how about how about 350 mm-hmm. and, you know so it and uh, that's another thing musicians uh <laughs> learning learning uh the art of bargaining is really good you can get you can uh I know in New York City you can barter. Right? There was a twenty buck dollar, twenty dollar t shirt. Only bought it for nine bucks because that's all I had. Be, you know, people will barter with you. Yep. And it's I'm learning that this year. Yeah, and make sure you ask for ask for what you like. Ask for your dream cut first, right? Because it's reasonable dream cut. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then you know work it down to what you actually wanted. Mm-hmm. Say if you want three hundred dollars to play three hours at uh, you know what whatever tell us three sixty for example, um, not saying that that's reasonable or for anybody or for everybody either. Uh, say that's what you want. Ask them for you know four hundred, four fifty, five hundred. Mm-hmm. Tell a venue like tell us they got a lot of money to spare anyway. Yep. And, and, you know it just depends on the venue as well. But ask for that extra cut. They might back you down a little bit, but you're you probably going to end up more than what you wanted, than what you actually wanted. Yeah, and you know, on that point, I actually have a, a musician friend who's playing hundreds of shows. So I, you know, not going to name drop for this purpose, but they're saying that they started raising the prices because they're playing like you know five to seven days a week, and you know two on Saturday or whatever, something crazy. 
and they're denying a lot of bookings because they're already booked, you know? And so going into this year, the, the thought process is like, well, I have to raise my rates, you know, supply and demand. Right. Yes. That's also true. You know, and, and they're telling me how crazy it is that they're like, yeah, I'll just double my price and venues eat it. And they just say, yep, no problem. And it's like, what? And it also goes to the point of, you know, making sure that you're selling yourself for what you're worth. No one's going to buy a, a $200 six hour set because that why yeah. is it $200. Right. What's the quality there? Yeah, on six hours. Get out of I, here. Yeah, this is, yeah this is, I mean, that's just a crazy, you know. Thing. Right, but your but, point's totally there. Yeah, if you're if you're if I'm only paying this musician fifty bucks for three hours, what are they doing? Yeah. Right. Why are they only charging it for themselves for fifty bucks? Right. Is it bad, or do they not know their worth? Right. Or are they like new on the scene? Right. Because if you're saying you're you're a veteran of the scene and you're fantastic, and you know. And they go, okay, 50 bucks. It's like, oh, wait. There's something off here. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, to your earlier point, there's so many angles to look at this there entire is. scene and, like, what is an act worth? Like, you know, I don't think anyone has a pinpointed, you know, number. But then again, there's also venues that'll pay you mm-hmm. twice what you think you're making yes. at a show. And it's like, so at what point do you find those venues, you know? And at what point do you drop off the ones that were paying you the highest last year, but now they're paying you the least this year. Like what, where does, it go? The, where does it go? And yeah. I'm learning that stuff right now. This is a whole other podcast. We could get that dive really deep into it. <laughs> um, Tommy, this has been a wonderful time. Yeah. Likewise, man. Thanks for having me. And what a fantastic uh, interview and podcast you run. I mean, th- this is Thank impressive, you. man. I, I really like this. Thank you. And I really like your music. So please go check out TommyBEntertainment.com. We can find out all about Tommy and all of his upcoming shows. He's got a few coming up in the next few weeks and months. Oh, and, yeah. uh, a few is an understatement, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but if you want to check us out, my name is Corey Rosen. This is a story podcast. You can check out more about us at CoreyRosenProductions.com. That's C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N Productions.com. You can find out more about me, my projects, this podcast, all the previous guests, all previous 118 plus guests that I've had on wow. beforehand. Yeah, I know. And uh, you can check out all of our future guests on all of our social medias. That's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, The Story Podcast. Uh, I really, you know, that's one thing I, I got to figure out. Figure What's out that? A, a handle for all my for all my things because on TikTok, I got The Story Podcast on TikTok. Oh, but okay. so that's, you don't have that's the same. Yeah, but on Instagram it's the underscore story underscore podcast. On Facebook it's the story Corey Rosen. I got to figure out some sort of handle. I'd I'd recommend. Can I give you advice on sure. that? Sure. If you go to everything that you'd possibly conceive of putting the story on, right? Even if you don't have them now and you're not even going to set them up, just go there anyway, right? And and type in the story and all the variations of and you know TikTok the story and you know, story podcast the underscore story or whatever. You know, which, which find which ones aren't taken and then do that for all platforms, Maybe. period. And I then could've. there's probably one that's not taken for each. And then you can go, okay, that one. Well, this is advice for all musicians, really. Yeah, yeah. I'd spent two days trying to find Tommy B Entertainment. Well, if you want to see all, all of our upcoming guests this Saturday at 4.30, we have my good friend Grimlock. He's a great rapper from the area. He's bringing on his brother who does awesome art and music as well in the mental health area wow and speaking of mental health and activism we have sir dominique jordan coming on sunday he is a he calls himself an artivist person who does art active activism oh. he works with the youth and helps in minority uh places to help uplift them get them out of the, you know the struggles that they deal with at, as being in, in poverty and etc so I'm really excited to talk with him. And Monday I have Rod, Rod, Rod Goez. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm really sorry if that's not. He is actually up for a CM, CPMA award as well as one of the uh, teaching studios around oh, here. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I'm excited to talk to him. I have Alex Danilla, a really great, really great guitarist from the area Tuesday. I have a really busy week, I'm now realizing. <laughs> <laughs> Thursday we have Melanie from uh, Big Mama. That would be really exciting. I'm I'm excited to talk to her. She's been around in the area for a long time. And uh, another interview I'm really excited for uh, next Saturday is the Big Fat Meanies. Oh, have you heard of them? I have not, but I want to hear about them. Oh, they're so good. It's 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 
punk rock with and they will probably explain this better better than me but it's like it's imagine punk rock with a whole horn section oh yes yes that's just the answer yes it sounds like success it sounds like success and they have been really successful and i'm really excited to talk to them and get all all that are insight on on you know why yeah why well to your point earlier because yes because yes exactly <laughs> that's, that's very true with all that said i hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll see you guys later